Uh, normally when you're talking about a, a concept in education, you'd start with some sort of definition. Um, so the concept and the definition here are particularly tricky. So let me just ask generally if you have anything, such as the example we've just been given by Dave, in your mind that generally follows the word open when we relate it to our education sphere. Anything's come to mind. So the example Dave just gave us, open access, pretty much every academic or librarian particularly will know all about open access. This was uh, a movement essentially to say that <coughs> publications should be available and accessible online um, often prior to them appearing in print but certainly when the the business of writing a chapter or an article or a book was finished the pre-print should be available i'm no expert in, in open access but there are plenty of people who are um, so that's probably the one thing that comes to mind does anybody have any others any experience of any other mentions of open in a work context source open source and that's perfectly fits your context <laughs> as well um, so when we come to technology communities who gather together and create code to produce software or even hardware often come from the open source community so open access open source open open data open data and there's a lot of a talk around open data today actually if you're on twitter and you follow these sorts of things then you may have noticed that there's a conference going on around open data today so this is again the principle that researchers share some of their uh, data with others and make it accessible so that people who perhaps have a, uh, an interest in developing something that's maybe slightly different but the data is relevant they can access it and they can build on it. So it's all about facilitating innovation in many cases, but it doesn't come without problems. So you can see where my definition problem is coming up as we look at all of these things. Um, any other that you've come across? Educational resources. Open educational resources. I'm so glad you said that one because that, that has been a major one in higher education that's been flagged up for quite a while. Known often as just OERs, um, the creation of small OERs or large OERs has been quite an endeavour in universities for a little while. So, right, so we're up to four. That's good. The area that I'm going to be talking about today is open educational practice or practices. And this is still very much emerging. The discussion about what this is is still very much emerging. But to me, this is a sort of an umbrella term for all of the types of activities that are happening in those earlier areas. So open practice is what's already happening within and has been for some time in the open source movement. Open data, again, is all about finding regimes, ways of working that are more open. So what is open? Well, fairly recently, we had a report published uh, by the European Commission uh, called Opening Up Education. <coughs> and they had um, a definition which perhaps makes it clearer why we have this definition problem. And that is that there is an understanding of open education that is constantly evolving. <coughs> so we haven't hit on one definition. And internationally, the conversations continue around what is open educational practice? What, is, what are open pedagogies? Certainly that is becoming an area of focus. What is open praxis? So th these are fluid areas at the moment. Now, there has been some research, however, that has helped to point us in some useful directions. The area I'm going to be focusing on is particularly digital practice, but open practice or open education is not solely about the digital domain. It uh, just happens to be the area that I have experienced and that I want to focus on. And you will see that on your tables today, and that's why I'm pleased to see some of you have devices, there are, there are links to a set of resources. Now, 
these are all pointing to the same set of resources, a Google document that is open. So you can either click on a QR reader on your phone, or you can put that short URL into your tablet to access the resources. One of the essential principles of open is that we are open to ideas in terms of where you start, where the conversations start, and what you want to access when. This is more about the individual's access to discussions around education, teaching and learning. So I don't want to be the person who constrains your thinking around open education. What I want to do is to bring you my experiences and show you some examples, but to facilitate your interaction with some of the resources that are out there. And there are many, and they're very rich. And depending on the area that you're most interested in, whether it's the research, the theory, the pragmatics of actually making open education happen, all of those resources will give you a good start in exploring. And they'll hopefully contribute to the richness of the discussions and interactions that we can have today. So open is the opposite of secrecy. The, the temptation is to think of open as the opposite of closed. And there's certainly a spectrum going on there. But a closed has lots of different connotations. So we're today sitting in a closed room. Yeah, doors are shut. The people on the other sides of the windows there, even though they can look in, clearly can't hear what we're saying. So are we having a closed session here? No, not particularly, because we have cameras, so we're capturing everything. Um, that's going to be shared openly and made available more openly so that those people who couldn't attend today can still access the information and the resources and can interact and take the conversation further. So I don't think we're breaking any open principles here today. But in terms of secrecy, when I think about secrecy, I think particularly about business secrets. And I'm very aware that HEIs have, over recent years, become businesses. Now, when they think about, as a corporate entity, their assets, they have to protect those. I understand that. That is normal within business. But when I think from a practitioner's point of view about the education that I deal with and I'm actually sort of talking to students, I want openness because I want to extend my access to other academics. I want to learn and continue that <coughs> learning by being open. So there is a tension there at some points between how open and where I'm open, who I share with, what I share, where those conversations happen in open or closed spaces, or is it perhaps on a spectrum of open and closed spaces? Now one of the, the researchers that I've particularly turned to is somebody called Catherine Cronin, who works in Ireland. And she did some research specifically around practitioners' open practices. And you'll find it in the links um, that you've got there from the sheet towards the bottom around the theories. She gave us four really helpful pointers towards the definition of open. She starts off by saying open is complex. Well, yeah, I can understand that it's complex. It's complicated. It's like the Facebook status. It's complicated. My relationship with open is complicated. So that's one, perhaps, to bear in mind as we move forward. It's also personal. So it's also situated within your contexts. So when we explored the words open, I would possibly hazard a guess that most of your work is in research. Yes. So open. Open data makes sense to you. Most of Kerry's work is in IT. Open source is a context that is familiar. So you can see that our ways into open are linked with our context. It's where we're coming from. So contextual, personal, complicated, and constantly negotiated. So my attitude towards openness may change if my circumstances change, if my, um, they could be my personal circumstances, they could be my location, where I'm working, they could be policies perhaps, institutionally. So constantly I have to rethink the points at which I am open and how at the sort of micro level as well as at the macro level 
I share and what I share and who I have these conversations with and where they are. So I think Catherine Cronin's work is a really nice way in to looking at how these big ideas of openness translate into the practical domain and how they affect us. And I think it's very important that we are really conscious of the fact that open is a personal decision as well. So how and where and when you're open will depend on your context and your personal framework uh, for interacting with open. So, moving away from the definition then, does anybody recognise this? Kerry might, because I think you've heard me present before. <laughs> I can't remember where it is though. This is in, in northern Spain, it's in a, a city called Palencia, um, which is a small rural city about the size of Kenilworth. Um, it's en route to much bigger places, uh, Leon and uh, the, the various sort of holiday destinations that you'll find along that north coast of Spain. So if you're traveling through, the nor through northern Spain on the train, the chances are you'll change in Palencia. It's a very un unassuming place. But the reason there is this um, sculpture in Palencia is because Palencia in 1208 was the site of the first Spanish university. So we're talking a long, long time ago. And if we're talking about returning to first practices, I think it's quite interesting just to observe how they have put up that statue. And to think a little bit perhaps about what Martin Weller tells us about what scholarship is, particularly in the digital domain, what scholarship is. So here you can see we've got a number of individuals talking. Now that's fundamental, is it not, to academic practice? You find people, like-minded people, perhaps who share your context. They may be in different institutions, and that whole border and location aspect we get through with the, the business of the digital. It helps us break through some of those borders, and we can have those academic conversations in much the same way as these people in the statue are having those conversations. I'd like to assume that the guy, the very, very tall guy here, standing up, doesn't remain standing up forever, that every now and then he sits down and somebody else gets up and they take the conversation on and they question each other and they interrogate each other. And isn't that how we sort of start off in terms of knowledge creation and returning to first principles? Primarily driven by intellectual curiosity. So we have questions within our domains, within our disciplines we want to solve. Now from a personal perspective, for me, that was around virtual exchange. And over the last um, years, so if I say seven years or so, that I have been focusing largely on how the digital domain can facilitate language-based interactions. So my role here is as a language teacher, but I teach French, um, and most of my work really is working with people from different cultures and different nationalities who want in a very short time frame to move their language on. Now there's only so much we can do in the classroom for that. We add homework and activities online to that. But around six years ago we set up a virtual exchange to help people within our classes connect with French native speakers in Clermont-Ferrand, which is a, a beautiful city in the centre of France. And that large-scale virtual exchange was how we were able to improve and extend the learner's experience of language learning. Uh, and that actually has led to us being a case study with the European project, and it's led to all sorts of serendipitous happenings but a lot of that happened in the open, mediated through social media. So we set up some hashtags, we start to interact, we used groups set up this year, in fact, on Google+, and three to 500 students a year have had these conversations in order to improve their French, or on the other side, their English. So mediated, in both languages, through both languages, but set through task-based learning. So that's sort of where my experience of open practice comes from, and hopefully some of the things that I can talk to you about today will explain why it has mattered so much to me uh, as an academic. 
<laughs> so what we're doing through returning to these first principles is actually getting through some of the boundaries, particularly in the digital domain, that we face in order to connect and continue and extend our scholarship. So very briefly, I just want to show you a few things that are happening out there in the academic community um, in terms of scholarly, scholarly conversations. And here's one very easy, easily accessible one. This is actually mediated through Twitter. Now, I can see some nods, so you're aware of Twitter, people are aware of Twitter, the use of Twitter. Every Wednesday evening, there is what we call a Twitter chat. And that happens usually from 8 o'clock in UK time till 9 o'clock. And a topic, usually with at least one, sometimes two, main speakers contributing, um, focuses the minds of academics wherever they are. And they can discuss things using these hashtags. So you can see there, this actually was taken, you can see at the top there, Simon's tweet, hashtag LTH. Chat. It's this little badge here as well. So participants, academic participants in LTHE chat join together in order to think about their perspectives and share their perspectives in the open around a particular topic. And what happens at the end of the hour is those conversations are then aggregated using Storify and there is a blog post attached to them. So again in your resources you'll see uh, right at the top, links to the LTHE blog. Now you can also see going on on the screen here, there is a hashtag HEA chat. That's the Higher Education Academy. Usually every, every month, so usually I think it's the third week of every month, an HEA chat combines with LTHE chat. So the same time, the conversations this time are directed by the HEA and again a blog post happens on the HEA blog um, in order to capture these insights into teaching, practitioner insights. So there is, there's one running this evening, obviously we're a Wednesday again, so at 8 o'clock this evening you'll see one and if you go along to the blog you can see the topic and you can see the academics involved in instigating that conversation, asking great questions and then um, resuming and pulling that together at the end so that, again, we have a resource, in effect, an open educational resource that's made available to the community. And these are discussing live issues, so they're very much up to date. Now, I've been in academia for 15 years, and one thing I'm very conscious of is stuff takes time. So the articles I've published, the books I've published, usually they take about a year to come to fruition and appear. This is where the seed work, this is where the grassroots conversations <coughs> happen. So for me, this is the seed bed of discussion. Where are you now on whatever that topic is that we're discussing? Let's talk about it. Let's find out who, uh, who's leading on this. Who's got some great ideas? Who's got perhaps some critical perspectives, which we all need, when because when we get together, particularly as teachers, we get enthusiastic about things. We can't help it with teachers. So somebody needs to say, hang on a minute, have you thought about that? Let's get it, let's, let's analyze it. Let's look at what it really looks like. Um, so critical perspectives as well emerge out of these conversations, these unbounded conversations. And the interesting thing is that they're mediated and facilitated by volunteers. So I worked for a term as uh, a team leader for uh, LTHE chat, so setting it up, inviting the speakers, writing the blog post, putting everything out, and then on the night, um, working to encourage people to participate, and then storifying the event. It is the most life-enhancing, although absolutely tiring, activity I've done, because it really is engaging with the cutting edge of your discipline or the um, teaching that's going on in your area. But that's not the only one that's out there. There are lots of, and I've just put a few here randomly really, there are lots of places where academic discussions happen. Uh, the conversation is perhaps the one that most people would recognize. It's published as a blog and again you can connect to it through social media. Wikipedia was one of the big um, 
and, and most revolutionary ideas at the center of knowledge creation. And, and I'm very pleased to say, that since I've become involved in the Wikimedia project, I'm very aware that, in fact, the quality of the discussions are improving because the, the organization itself is now looking at those people who can contribute. And they're thinking about, well, actually, we need a more diverse set of contributors. We need to make sure that this is not all white male dominated. It's not all Anglo-centric, Anglo which it had been, certainly English-speaking centric. Uh, and we're seeing some really creative, great ideas coming out of Wikimedia, which is actually much bigger than Wikipedia itself. It's a vast array of um, knowledge creation tools, including lots of really helpful tools for education in schools built on the data that is already available in that um, ecosystem. YouTube and TEDx. Yes, if I mention TEDx, that's good. I'm, I'm really pleased to see some nods, so I'm seeing people who understand what I'm referring to. YouTube and TEDx are, again, spaces where people can engage with quite comprehensive ideas. The RSA um, and their section, their series of animations, um, so you, you come across all sorts of short examples that take you through big ideas uh, for now, that just give you an insight. And the ones at the bottom here have been more local. So these are Google Plus communities that I've been involved in personally. Um, so the Mahara users Midlands, we use Mahara here at Warwick as an e-portfolio solution. That's a Midlands group and we meet and discuss together um, through a Google Plus. So we actually share information about the software or about the uses of the software and how it's going in our context through that very open group. Uh, and FOS, uh, which is about flexible open learning and creative HE community, again, these are all small online communities where the discussions are happening. So it's kind of like the breakout rooms, if you like, uh, where, where YouTube and TEDx are vast amphitheaters of information. This is where you can go and then share more personal or more contextual sets of information. So again, if we're looking on that scale of openness, this is where you might quite quickly and easily set up a group and invite people you bumped into through social media to discuss something that is close to your passion and close to what you do. Very quick and easy to set up. Clearly, you'll be having thoughts around data security and information and just who owns what's happening in these electronic spaces. And, and that's important. I mentioned earlier, it's very important that we are critical. I want to talk you through how I made my decisions around that a little bit later. But first, I just want to establish what open looks like and what it looks like to the academic community. So next is an example, again, of a Google Plus community. This was one specifically set up as part of the We're Here Know How project. So We're Here is Warwick International Higher Education Academy. Are we aware of We're Here? <laughs> so I'm, a, I'm a, a, a fellow of We're Here. And the small project that we ran over the summer was a mixture of cohorts from staff and students, people who were interested in open practice and wanted to find out a little bit more. So we set ourselves up a blog and the students who participated also blogged and we set ourselves up an open space and we invited some key thinkers and researchers in the area of open practice to join us. Now this is totally open, it's a Google Plus group and you would just have to Google we here know how or use a search engine of your choice and you, sh you will be able to join that. As you can see it's quite a small community at the moment but we're focusing on the Warwick experience. And what we were doing through that was looking as well for practitioners at Warwick who are open practitioners. They may never have even considered categorizing themselves as open practitioners. But what they do can be picked up on the internet. So they're clearly engaging with a wider public than just the people in their class 
or the people in their school or the people in their department by actually taking to the internet and talking about what they do. So the students then search for open practitioners and we managed to identify some, some champions at Warwick. Steve's had his know-how badge for a little while. So we looked for the digital imprint of Warwick researchers, Warwick activists, Warwick educationalists, um, Warwick admin staff, people who were active and open about their work in a professional context. And this was a way to draw them together. So we used a Google group to do that. And um, what we also did was to put together some pages which are based here, sets of resources, which are based on the Learning and Development Center website. So within Warwick, the Learning and Development website has a link that says Know How. What we wanted to do was to find practical resources to make open more accessible. So open as a concept, as I said at the beginning, it's difficult to define. So how can people access it? How do people know if they're open or not, if we can't really define it? So we wanted to put together short video tutorials, examples of practice, and those are based on the LDC website. And in fact, as you can see on the table there, we have sets of little cards. So there are five cards that take you through some examples of practice. So I'm just going to bring these around so that you've got um, a set on your table because I'm going to ask you to do something next. Voila. Thank you. Voila. So take a look through those cards. Okay, I'll give you another set. So you'll see they're numbered one to five. One to five. Yes. So the, there's a little number at the top. You've got two sets there, so that's fine. And there's plenty more you can take um, at the end. Have a little scan through. You can see really what we tried to do is to operationalize open and to help others operationalize open so what does open practice mean if a I can't define it and and B I don't know where to start so what we tried to do was to pr present a series of resources to help people know where to start and crucially really we tr focused first of all on what is your digital presence and what do you know about it? Who owns the data? What do you share? What do you know that you can or can't share? And what decisions therefore follow from that? And bearing in mind they're personal, they're contextual, they will be different for all of us. So what I'm going to ask you to do now, having talked for a little while, is to think a little bit about open practice and think about your context. And have a little conversation on your table and on the whiteboard over here, what I'd like you to do is to come up with an example, or more than one example if you're feeling creative, of what open practice might look like in your role. Would it be as simple as joining an LTHE chat? Would it be sharing your resources online through SlideShare or one of the tools? What would it look like for you, or what could it look like for you if you chose to consider what you routinely do as part of your practice. And hopefully, in a few minutes, we'll build up a list up here. What sort of practical things would come out of taking an open lens, if you like, to the practice that you have at the moment? Okay, and to leave that with you for 10 minutes or so so you can think about it, and then you'll find a pen, pens up on the whiteboard there. So when you've agreed something, contribute to our list. So I'll tell you just a little bit about my personal experience of going down this route. Um, but clearly, you know, with the caveat that all the decisions I made were personal, contextual, um, and are continually negotiated and may change because that's the reality of open practice. Um, so for me, I uh, undertook a role in learning technology within my uh, discipline that meant that I had to provide leadership in terms of um, learning design for language teachers, select appropriate tools and help 
move the language teaching design, learning design on into a digital age. It was very apparent to us that we had, and this is going back a little while before Moodle uh, arrived at Warwick, um, we had a group of staff who wanted to provide additional resources to students. We had a group of students who wanted to access additional resources, but we had no guidance as to where to put them and how best to do that. So we started down that route about seven years ago. Um, now, that meant that it kind of shifted my perspective on my position in terms of open practice. Uh, I wasn't really aware of that at the time. I wasn't really thinking about open practice. But I was thinking about how do I raise awareness of digital spaces with these groups of language teachers. And having been an early adopter, and I've been in my career for 30 years now, having been an early adopter of technology, how do, how do I share the enthusiasm that I have for what is actually essentially rather front-loaded, rather complicated, um, fraught with <laughs> all sorts of decision-making, um, and is not exactly inviting people to you know, a happy party. <laughs> so how do I make the connections that I need to make in order to progress the role that I'm in? So the decision I made really was to make those decisions on the basis of what suited me as a person rather than what suited me as an employee of the University of Warwick. So I'm, I, I'm lent away from an identity that was institutionally based. And I, although it's my identity, certainly on Twitter, at Warwick Language, it makes a very clear connection with my personal professional role and my place of employment, my personal and professional development happens from me as a person. I made that decision on the basis that I may work in other places and I don't want to lose all the effort I've put into my professional development at that point. Um, so that was why I arrived at that decision. Why I arrived in terms of, of, of the selection of technologies at different points, well, I have to admit that that has been influenced by where I've found the best communities for the role that I'm carrying. So in terms of language teaching, in terms of generic education and use of technology, those communities have dictated the spaces that I've gone into and played with and tried in order to identify where I'm best situated. And that's been a personal and professional journey that has been really interesting um, and has evolved over time. Uh, so I think perhaps when I look back on some of those decisions, SlideShare was an early decision. I wanted to take some of the resources I used for teaching and make those available so that others could find them and use them. Now I had a quick flick through my SlideShare account which is, has become where I upload my PowerPoints pretty much every time I make a PowerPoint for, for teaching, or also for presenting and for conferences. Um, and and disappointed to find now somewhere down the line that SlideShare is owned by Microsoft. And that kind of colours my feeling about that space. But I still use it, and I use it with Creative Commons licensing. So in other words, when I upload my slides, rather than going by the default that is up there on SlideShare, that the content is shared and uh, the copyright sits within the mechanism that holds the content, I want the content to point back to me and my professional contribution. Um, so Creative Commons licensing has been the route that has enabled me to do that. I use a very open Creative Commons license. There are six sets, there are six licenses. I use the CCBY, which is essentially to say, you're welcome to have this, you can download it, you can use it wherever you like, but please make sure that you acknowledge that actually you got it from here and you got it from me. And that's just a respect, really. And I think that's really useful for me as a teacher because I can point you to, at any point in time, some very active sharers within my discipline whose work I have found particularly useful. So I've built up a trust network, a trusted collection of people who I know I can turn to who have useful resources either for my discipline or from the activities that I'm involved in at any point in time. So those have been kind of my thought processes behind 
the places that I go to and what I share where. But as I say, they will be particular and peculiar to your context and your thinking. So what I'd like us to do now is to have, again, a few minutes um, conversation within the table. What do you feel are the barriers or what are the needs, if you like, of pursuing some of these activities for you personally, in your context? What would be your concerns Well, in the concerns and decision-making process that we're having? And I think if I had to distill them down to one word, that word would be control. Where does the control lie? And obviously our um, instinct perhaps is that the control lies with my employer because they pay me and I need to be paid in order to do what I do. And obviously that, that is true. And if you're told by your employer you will not do X, then you won't do X in a professional capacity that then leads back to your employer. Clearly that would be a foolish thing to do. However, you are not entirely owned by your employer. So there, there is a point at which what you create is part of what you do. And you may feel, I certainly did, that as a, as a teacher, my role is not just to teach in this particular place of employment with this particular set of students. My role is to be part of a teaching community who think about teaching as a discipline, who think about what they do in terms of the impact they can have, not just locally on the students who are sitting in front of me, but beyond that. I feel very connected with the importance of being one of the people that helps them move forward in their lifelong learning journey. They will be a student with me for a year, two years, maybe three or four years at best, but then they will go off and live elsewhere. And I'm very aware that the work that I do now is very connected. It's part of an ongoing discourse of my learning experience. My teachers inspired me. They inspired me to do what I do. Even 30 years on, I'm still, I can still point you back to educators I met during my journey who inspired me to do what I do. And I feel that there's a legacy issue there, that this is something that I wish to continue. It's important to me that there's a healthy teaching community out there. It's probably very important to you as researchers that there's a healthy research community out there who have engaged with their thoughts around ethics and control and have decided to contribute to their um, overall profession. Uh, that's certainly true of the open source community. There's, there's a very strong um, commitment to supporting the work of fellow um, coders in creating. Uh, and they're very, I'm rightfully proud of what they do. So, right, we must move on because time is against us, but I will capture that and I will obviously tweet it. I think Dave's probably done it already. So finally, just coming back to the first principles idea of working in a seat of knowledge creation. This commons thinking approach, that's how uh, Kenrick dis defines it, a thinking about the, what the university's wider role is within society. Is it to serve itself or is it to serve others? I think there's a very fun fundamental point that universities, and you know, I leave this to the leadership within universities, have to consider. What is our role? Where do we want to be in a hundred years' time? Will we be just the statues that we saw in Palencia in 1208? There is no university in Palencia, in Spain. A vibrant academic community existed in 1208. Those academics were tempted away by more interesting cities, a little bit further away. So they went to Valladolid. There is a thriving university in Valladolid. We have to think about the sustainability of what we do and the roles that we hold and the importance of what we do to the public in terms of our creation. You know, if we put it in grand terms, to knowledge creation that could save the planet. How are we contributing to the sustainable development of our world? In order to do that, I'd like to connect to this Baudelaire-inspired idea of the flaneur, the academic who 
browses and looks and thinks about things. Now we often don't get much time, we're t very time pressured in our roles. But that role of being a flaneur, being an observer, being someone who goes into digital spaces and sees what happens and critically engages with it and thinks about what really matters to them. And then by managing their digital online presence influences where we go. I think that is the invitation that openness and open educational practice offers us. And I hope you're starting to think about that for you personally as well. And I hope that the know-how resources that we've made available on the cards but also on the resources page will help you on that journey to find a personal, situated, contextual and possibly constantly evolving vision of open educational practice that works for you. Um, we chose as our image, if you like, our visual image, wildflowers. We, so the we here Know How project was represented with many, many images of wildflowers, as you'll see on the badge there. And that was all about how just a few seeds scattered here and there can bring a lot of beauty to the planet. And, and that's what I'd like you to, to leave you thinking about. If you can think back to the summer and the wonderful wildflower roundabout that we had um, at Warwick, and think about how you are one of those wonderful wildflowers and how we can make a difference. So thank you. Thank you very much for your giving up your lunchtime and, and participating so fully. Thank you for coming. Thank you.